Today is the 27th of June, 2018. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the uh, record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? Sure. I'm, uh, my name is Daniel C. Wilcox, uh, born January 26, 1946 in Flushing, New York. Did you attend school in Flushing? No, I was only was there as an infant. My family moved up to Del Mar, New York. Uh, I was like three months old, and okay. I grew up in Del Mar. Okay. And uh, did you graduate from high school? Yes, I did. Uh, what year did you graduate? Uh, 1964, from Vincentian Institute in Albany. And after graduation, did you go on to college? Yes, I went to uh, Fordham University in New York City uh, for two years, uh, and then returned to Albany and finished up at the State University at New York uh, in Albany. Um, I finished up in January of uh, 1969. And uh, what did you uh, receive your bachelor's in? Bachelor's in English. Okay. And once you graduated, did you start working? Did you go into the service? Uh, uh, well, I, yeah, I worked for um, a friend of mine who had a plan. He wanted to travel cross country mm -hmm. that summer. And uh, so I thought, gee, maybe I could do that. Uh, so I figured the draft board would no, I was finishing up in June of that year, mm -hmm. so I didn't bother letting them know that I grad I actually finished my courses in January. Uh -huh. And uh, so I went to work at Albany Med and saved my money, and then came June, my friend and I took off and traveled across country for the summer, basically, uh -huh. the summer. So before I left, I wrote a letter to my draft board telling them that I was uh, going to be traveling across the country and I'd be back home in, uh, I don't know what they said, August, I mean, it must have said August just to cover my ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when did you receive your draft? Uh, when I got back, I went, I, uh, when I got back, I went to work in this lunch counter where I'd worked before. And uh, I was in there, my mother worked at the post office down the street and she came up while I was working at the counter. Oh, I got a letter for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, it was that greeting letter. Uh -huh. uh, so that was, I think that was early September. Uh, it may have been the end of August. I think I, I think my um, draft physical when went down there was early September. Yeah. Was that at the post it, office? Down it, it was in Albany. Yeah, okay. I think it was a post office. I think it was. I don't know okay. exactly where it was in Albany. So you en ended up entering the service. Well, yeah. The 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 the, the story of the even of the the. Physical is an interesting prelude. Oh, to oh sure. Story. <laughs> so what what happened was, um, you know, I've been in college. I was anti-war. Vietnam War was going on. I was anti-war, um, and I'd had student deferments. And at that point in time, the only deferment you could get was for undergraduates. So I knew I was going in, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so I went down for it. And I remember reading in some of the. Um, draft counseling material that I'd, I'd seen, that at the end of the, uh, you know, uh, pr the process there, you'd get a form and then you would sign a uh, uh, loyalty oath. Mm -hmm. and, but you could refuse to sign the loyalty oath. It would not keep you out of the Army, uh, but it would delay your induction. So all I was interested in was delays. So uh, when I got to that, I, I wrote a little statement. I refused to sign this oath, uh, uh -huh. whatever. And I actually signed my name to it. And uh, an officer came in, sat me down, a little room, you know, and said, oh, no. He was all upset about this, that I didn't sign it. And all he says, you know, that's not going to keep you out of the Army. I said, oh, I understand. He says, the main thing it's going to do is going to keep me here late tonight. And I said, like, uh -huh. like, I could care less, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy, do you want to talk to him? We have to shut that off and we'll pick yeah, it up. I'll just stop for a second. Yeah. We're back. So, so the officer said I was going to keep him late there that night. And then what they'd have to do is they would do a security check. Uh -huh. So they'd run through whatever they did, FBI or whoever they did that stuff. So that's all I cared about. I just cared about delaying it because I um, was planning to get married at the time. Mm -hmm. 
I had to, uh, and uh, so I just figured I'll just wait until I get my actual induction notice, and uh, we'll go from there. So I got my induction notice in sometime in November. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I immediately planned an immediate wedding and got married. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then I went in on uh, December 5th in 1969. Uh, so in retrospect, I can't say this is for certain, but it seems like other people I spoke to that were inducted in September of 69 uh, and went into the army and went to Vietnam, many of those were in the Cambodian invasion. And I think mm -hmm. perhaps that delay may have kept me out of that. Mm -hmm. um, my military career is basically one piece of basically good timing or mm -hmm. dumb luck uh -huh. all along. So as, as you'll hear in the trajectory of the story, there were all these moments where, oh, now I have my good luck. So, um, I buy lottery tickets, but I don't expect to win. I had my good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, where did, uh, where did you go for your basic training? So I went to Fort Dix. So uh, oh, this is another story about the when you're there that day when you actually go down and you show up and you know you're going to be getting on the bus to yep. go to Fort Dix. So we went into this room and at that point they were actually uh, drafting people for the Marines. So they brought us into this room uh, and they said, okay, I uh, just want to let you know that none of you here are going into Marines. There was a great sigh of relief. <laughs> and think, we turned to each other and said, we never knew we'd be happy going into the Army. <laughs> so, apologies to any Marines out there, but uh, yeah. So I went down to went down to Fort Dix uh, in December, and we were there about two weeks. And the holiday season was coming, mm -hmm. and we were all offered a was it a week leave? I think it must have been a week leave for the holidays. Wow! Even though we didn't have the time yet, they yeah. said we go on the books. Uh -huh. So yeah, of course. So we went home for the holidays and then came back and finished mm -hmm. up our basic training in New Jersey, you know, 20 below weather. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> after basic training, where did you so go? So then we got our order after basic training and I was, that was um, sent to Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember the that aptitude test you take in the, when you first went into oh, the yeah. army and all yeah. this stuff? Well, I scored very well on the radio test. It was basically, they gave you four or five letters in Morse code, and then you had to write them down when they gave you a little sample thing. Well, mm -hmm. Apparently, I did very well on that. So I was sent down to radio school uh, at Fort Knox. Uh, and unlike other, I think most AITs, at least the combat AITs, I think were eight weeks. Uh, this was 12 weeks. And it was 12 weeks of basically learning Morse code and improving your skills in Morse code, as well as radio procedure and mm -hmm. maintenance and all that other kind of stuff. But half the day was spent in a room with headphones on, taking down code, mm -hmm. and it was individually paced mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, it, it, you reached a certain level, then they would speed it up and they would speed it up. And, but one of the great things about radio school was that it was really school and it wasn't a lot of the kind of stuff that you had in uh, basically basic training mm -hmm. and certainly not even in the AIT, in the, in the combat training uh, stuff where you have these drill, drill sergeants screaming at you and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And they, they wanted you to spend time on your, your studies. So your first two weeks you did weekend and KP guard duty, mm -hmm. or K, guard duty and KP on the weekends. The rest of the time, you had your weekends off, mm -hmm. and you would do your KP or guard duty uh, during a regular work week. Mm -hmm. So uh, for 10 weeks, I had weekends off. What did you do on the weekends? Go down to Louisville, basically. Mm -hmm. Basically go to Louisville, or hang out there. Uh, 
it was just uh, it was really nice. It was like going to, going to school. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, part way through the training, those um, people who did well, uh, they selected the top of the class, and we were to be sent to Fort Gordon, I believe, uh, for teletype operator training. So I was processed out. I had my bags, had everything. I'm wait. I'm waiting at the bus with the, for the bus with the other guys, and the sergeant comes up to me and he says, uh, "Wilcox, I don't have your your uh, files here. I don't have your orders. Your name's not on the orders." I said, "I don't know. I don't know what that's about." And he said, "Well, he says uh, he says it means you can't go." I said, well, "Okay, whatever." So I had to process back in. Uh -huh. Well, it turns out <clears throat> that as a result of me not signing that loyalty oath, I was I couldn't get a security clearance. Ah, okay. And in fact, every time I changed duty station, or even assignment within uh, a unit, from like uh, a line company to a headquarters company or something like that, I was interviewed by the S2 officer, which is the security guys. And because of like, not signing security uh -huh. oath, and you know, I was on, I was on SDS before I went in. I was uh, on mailing lists for all these different left-wing organizations. I was even getting a publication uh, once a month from mainland China. <laughs> so I was on the list. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I couldn't even get a confidential clearance, which mm -hmm. meant I couldn't even be a regular op radio operator in a combat unit. But you need at least that for that. So they let me finish out radio school, which I was grateful for because my whole plan in the army was to, like going in, delay everything as, as long as possible uh -huh. and to uh, just spend as much time in training or whatever, you know. I was just marking time as they say. Yep. So after I finished radio school, then they sent me over into, the, the Fort Knox is basically an armor Center. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to be trained as a, a tank crewman in a, um, AIT there, and that was a regular eight-week AIT. Now, did you learn how to drive? A yeah, I was a tank driver. That was my basically my, my MOS level. Um, so I could drive a tank. Uh, you know, we pulled maintenance, all the other stuff. You know, we would, took them out to the firing range. They did all the fire, fired all the weapons, the 50 caliber, the 30 caliber, the you know. Then our, plus our uh, tankers' sidearms are the, the grease gun, the 45, mm -hmm. uh, and the 45 pistol. So we had to quali qualify those. We didn't have to like be marksmen or anything like that, um, but we had to qualify on those things. Um, and then, uh, so I was a since I was a college graduate, and I was in this unit with. Everybody there, I don't think there was anybody older than me. And most of them, I was like 22, a lot of them were 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I think there was even one or two that might have been 17 years old. Um, and uh, so I was like the, the oldest guy. You were the old man. I was the old man. <laughs> I'm only a few years older than that. You know? so, uh, so we went through the training and uh, at the end, Half my training class went to Vietnam, and I was in the lucky half. Mm -hmm. I didn't go. So I ended up being assigned to a uh, support unit uh, for the armor school at Fort Knox, and ended up slipping tanks back and forth. I'll say something about that. During the AIT, I was there in May uh, of 1970, and uh, I was there during um, Kent State, when mm -hmm. the students were shot at Kent State. And we were having some kind of company gathering. I don't remember what it was for. It was one of these regular things of, in an auditorium, and the captain would get up there and he would talk about something. Mm -hmm. So he got. We were there one day, and he got there and he said, uh, "So, uh, did you hear about what happened at Kent State? How the students were shot? They were throwing rocks at the the National Guard and all that." He says, and he kind of threw it out to the to us and said something like. Uh, uh, well, you know, what do you think of that? Do you have any opinions on that? Not many people did. I raised my hand and I said, uh, 
I stood up and I said, well, you know, well, these students were just exercising their First Amendment rights to protest government policy. I said they pose no danger to these uh, National Guard people. It's to my understanding the National Guard people were on a hill far away and, and they just fired into the crowd and killed the students. And I, I you know, well, <laughs> he went up one side of me and down the other, you know, about, oh. you know, uh, I don't exactly remember what he said, but it, but he did, basically did not agree with me, and uh -huh. I was, you know, and and I sat down. After I said my piece, there was a kid sit, sitting next to me, literally a kid, uh, from some rural place, Kentucky or Georgia, or someplace, and he looked at me and he said, "I didn't know people could have ideas like that." Really? That's what he said. <laughs> So, I mean, that's, and that's a lot of what the recruits were. I mean, really, uh -huh. you get these kids, and some, some were there because they uh, got caught speeding or something, and the judge sure. says, you know, you go to jail or you go in the Army. So they went in the Army. Um, and many didn't even have their high school diplomas. So, um, so, I, well, so I ended up uh, at the Armor in the tank unit, basically. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't bad. We'd drive tanks out to the firing line, um, pull maintenance, drive them back, clean them. Uh, that was basically what we did. Spent a lot of time in the motor pool, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times just sitting around in the firing line waiting for whoever was using the tanks to finish. The, the worst part about it was in August when the um, cadets from West Point came down for their armor training, and then we had to hump the ammo for them. Otherwise, we'd have to load the ammo or anything into the mm -hmm. tanks. And it's, a, it's a heavy process. It's you know one shell sure. at a time. You're passing them up. Yep. Uh, it's a big pain in the ass. And uh, uh, but the cadets had to have the armor home for them. So we used to hate when the cadets were. <laughs> and there were even instances where you know some cadets would be coming back from drinking and walking across the field, and a bunch of regular guys would like jump them. <laughs> Beat them up and stuff like that. Oh, so, um, but uh, the other thing is that my unit uh, was used like as a like a holding unit. What the guys were coming back from Vietnam who had six months, nine months, maybe a year left in their service if they you know if they mm -hmm. uh, enlisted, and uh, so a lot of Times we would get these uh, Vietnam returnees uh, assigned to us, most of whom had no tank background. They were just thrown in there. Many of them were grunts. And, uh, you know, and they would do just to fill out the unit and to do work. So I got to, to meet lots of guys who had just come back from Vietnam, um, became good friends with many of them, we'd hang out, and drink beer, and have them over to my house. By that time, mm -hmm. my wife had moved down with our baby. Oh. So we were living off base, and mm -hmm. we had a you know, pretty nice existence. I was basically going to a job every day. And, um, and, but I would hear all kinds of stories from these guys, you know, f f fresh out of the jungle. Uh, and uh, I began to see the kind of things that, that we hear about later on, about like PTSD and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But I didn't know that as that then. It was just stories that people mm -hmm. were, were telling me. Um, but one of the, the tragic parts of that was that uh, we were bringing tanks out. Well, by this time, I, at some point I became the company clerk because their, their company clerk was leaving. Um, they didn't have anyone else. I was a college graduate. I could type. I was going to ask, how could you type? I could type. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, could you type? And I said, oh yeah. So I ended up as a company clerk, which was even better because, you know, driving a tank, your fatigues get dirty and greasy sure. and all that kind of stuff. You know, I could wear the same set of fatigues basically all week working as a company clerk and no, no KP and no guard duty. Mm -hmm. And you work Monday to Saturday noon. Um, so I was basically going to a, an office job every day. Um, so that was, that was a really good part of it. So anyway, that was assigned to, to, as a company clerk. and. The, the crew went out with some tanks to a firing line, and one of the guys in the tank um, was killed. Um, what had happened was, when you take the 
tanks out to the, on the road, the, the gun turn is towards the back and it's secured. And uh, you, you drive, the driver has his little spot up front. And then when you get out to the um, firing line, you got to turn the turret around. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the guy on the top, there's always at least two, there's a driver and he can't see very much. He's just looking straight ahead. Mm -hmm. The guy at the top, where normally it'd be a sergeant or something like that, would just sort of be there to, as a visual thing, and we had radio contacts and stuff. So we get out to the firing line, and the um, they have to turn it, the turret around to get the gun facing the right way, and that's operated from the not by the driver. The driver can't do that. It's operated from uh, up on top on the turret, and uh, there's a little handle that goes like this, but it has a, a switch on it and you got to push the button. So the guy up there was some grunt from Vietnam who just returned and he didn't want to uh, tank. So he they said turn it and push the handle, turn the handle, so he put the handle and didn't didn't do anything. So he's yelling down to the, the, the driver and the driver leans back. Now the driver's outside the turret. He's mm -hmm. in the room space outside the turret and when the turret uh, there's a space for, for the driver to get into the driver's seat from there so the driver leans back like this and yells up you got to push the button and the guy while well, the handles down pushes the button and the, the turret oh, jumps and he gets caught in there and he gets killed so and he was a guy from Amsterdam New York uh, Henry Pauling I remember his name Henry Pauling from Amsterdam, and he he and I used to joke because he went he was assigned to Fort Knox originally to go to Cook School and he flunked out, so they put him in uh, our uh, our tank unit, and uh, we used to joke because he came in one day before me, but we would be getting out on the same day because of a weekend kind of thing. So we mm -hmm. we were, you know how many days you got left that kind of thing, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> And so I know him pretty well. Uh, and we, when I was still living in the barracks, uh, you know, he was in our section of the barracks. Well, anyways, they needed an escort for his body. Oh. So they asked me if I wanted to be his escort. Since he was from Amsterdam, and I had family living in um, Del Mar, yeah. New York. And I said, sure. So I had the, the honor, it really was an mm -hmm. honor, to escort him back to his family, uh, and I was met by an officer, a local officer in the, in the National Guard, I think, um, and it took me up, we went up to the, meet, meet the family, and then the family asked if I wanted to stay for the wake and for the funeral, and I said yes, so they got me the time to do that, mm -hmm. and uh, established a nice relationship with the family, because I was able, oh, because I was hanging out with this guy, sure. and I was able to talk to them about, you know, things that we did and everything. And then uh, when it came time for me to leave, the officer said, I can get you a couple more days if you want to go back and with your family. So I had like maybe two more, two more days he gave me. Mm -hmm. So then I got back to my unit. And after I got back, I got, um, the, the funeral director wrote to my commanding officer and a really nice letter commending me on my Oh, my nice. service and how nice I was and courteous mm -hmm. and everything. So then, of course, it goes all the way down the line. That next, <laughs> the next officer puts his cover letter on. Uh -huh. I think there are about three different letters in there, um, which I which I kept. Uh, yeah, I was kind of proud of that that kind of thing. Sure. So then, um, so then I was in. Uh, oh, oh, I can't remember when I became company clerk. And I'm not, and after that, I eventually became what they call a battalion legal clerk, which I moved up to battalion headquarters, and it was basically the same thing, typing, but it was step up, and I would do type up a lot of things like Article 15s, and I think I even worked on typing up uh, uh, a court martial one time, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and that was an even cushier job than working in the company level. Uh, uh, but I can't remember what point I went over there, so, but in, Around the December of '70, I got uh, a down on a levy to go to Vietnam. 
basically a list of people that they want to send to Vietnam. And there were six or eight of us on the list. And I was sent for orientation training. Um, I, was, I even have, I think I still have it at home, uh, a phrase book of Vietnamese that they gave you and all this stuff. Uh, and one guy got orders and the orders um, had processed out of the company. He was actually on his way home first and then he got, they canceled the orders and they gave him new, new orders to come back. And myself and others on the, on the levy never got our orders and they basically canceled the levy because that was January, by that time it was January of 71. And I would have had less than a year by going mm -hmm. to Vietnam. Um, and they were starting to go through a big reduction in force at that point. So again, a little piece of, of good luck um, that I ended up with. And, and um, so working in the battalion headquarters, I have a funny story with that too. With When I was a, a company clerk, one, the thing we did every day was a morning report. And so how many people are here, how many are in wall, how many are on leave, and all this stuff, very precise report. Um, and so I moved up to the battalion headquarters and I moved up at the end of the month and one of my jobs was to compile all the morning reports and total up the numbers and fill out a monthly report uh, for them. So I was, the day, the day, I, the day I arrived in um, headquarters to do that um, was the end of the month and I was given this form and everything was filled out in the form and I, all I had to do was total the numbers from all the companies and then put that number in this one box. So I did. Very simple job. About a week later, the S2 officer, the secure, security guy, comes by and he shows me the form and he says, uh, did you fill out this form? And I said, well, I put that number right there in that box. He said, uh, did you know that this this form is classified? I said, well, um, it's not classified until it's completed, right? I know enough about that kind of stuff. He said, yeah. He said, but you, you, you don't have a clearance. I said, I know, but when I got the form, it wasn't classified. <laughs> he said, but you put the number in. I said, yeah, I did. At that point, it became classified. <laughs> He just went away shaking his head. He, just couldn't, he couldn't figure this stuff out. <laughs> so, so again, from that, that very first thing, from when I was uh, for uh, my draft physical, I might not, not sign this loyalty oath, uh -huh. that kind of carried through. There's all these threads that come, come through the whole thing. So then in, it was about August or so of um, 71, my wife and and me and my son, we took, I think I took two weeks leave. Probably took all the leave I had because I hadn't been using it. Uh, and we decided we'd go home for two weeks. So we drove back to New York and then we came back to Fort Knox. I get back to Fort Knox within days. An order came down that uh, they, and this was, this was army wide that all the draftees would be getting out three months early. And uh, if you had less than three months, which I think I did at that point, you would be getting out in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get back and all of a sudden I'm going home again in that, two weeks. That was a piece of good news. So another piece of good news and good timing. So mm -hmm. again, uh, you know, so I got home uh, early. I got out in September of, uh, uh, early September of, I think, of uh, 71. Mm -hmm. So, it was, like I said, it was good luck um, all the way through. Now, did you uh, sign up for unemployment or did you go? Yeah, I first work? signed up for unemployment. And the other thing I did, I had taken the state test before I was in, before I went into the Army. I was on a state list. And so I just let them know I was back and mm -hmm. that I was a veteran. So I got on a preferred list, and I was getting canvases, and I eventually got a job in uh, um, down in, in New York City. My my uh, wife's family was from Northport, so that's where we were living at the time. I was out in Northport, and uh, I got a job uh, with New York State with the 
uh, is now known as the Office of Disability Determinations. And basically, it's the state agency that does the, the, so, the medical decisions on Social Security disability claims. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was, and was in New York City. Um, and I think I started my job, it didn't start on December 5th, which was the day I went in the Army in 69. It was within a couple of days of that. Mm -hmm. So it was like two years later, here I am starting, starting my job and everything. And subsequently, my um, veterans credits did me well. It helped me get that job, bumped me up on the line when uh, uh, needed. Uh, for promotion exams, I got five extra points or something. I don't remember what it was. And the, at one point, I was there with the state about nine years, and uh, since we work with Social Security, we had this uh, link, actually a pretty intimate relationship with the Social Security Administration, and they were hiring for their regional commissioner's office down there in New York City, same, same basic area, lower Manhattan. Um, they were looking for someone with state agency experience. And so they put out a list, and the qualifications essentially met one of the guys that I work with, he had, it was sort of written around his experience, mm -hmm. and that, that's who they were looking to hire. I had same similar experience, not quite as much of each, but I had all the little elements, mm -hmm. and I have five points veterans credit. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so when it came down, when they scored all of that, I ended up getting the job that had been written for him. Uh -huh. So, and that worked out all right. Eventually, when I went back to the state, I eventually he became my supervisor. And so, it was, I don't think there was any hard feelings. I don't know. I, <laughs> I never felt a knife in my back. But it helped me get a job mm -hmm. with the feds. So now, along the way, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yes, I did. <clears throat> um, I did. When I got, after uh, I was back, I was actually, when I was working for the state, um, I, first I went to school uh, at Hunter. I, was, I took a few courses uh, in English, I was a graduate of school in English. I took maybe four courses. And then the state offered this program, we were disability analysts, and they offered a program at NYU. It was a brand new thing they were starting up. It was sort of experimental. And it was in the School of Professional Studies, and it would have been a master's in disability evaluation. It was a, it, it, some of the states had tried it, there was uh, elsewhere, but New York State decided, well, this is a pretty good idea. So as state employees, um, they were paying our tuition to go to this, take this course. And I would, so I said, yeah, let me take, I'll take, the, I'll sign up. So I signed up for it and I took courses. Well, they were paying tuition. I could still get the, the GI Bill. The mm -hmm. GI Bill was just the money they gave you. It was not based on anything other than the fact that you were in the service and it was a certain amount of mm -hmm. dollars. So that helped. Uh, no, I think the state even paid for the books, now that I think about it. <laughs> so I was getting a free ride with the state, and I was getting the money from the, from, on the GI Bill to, you know, basically whatever else I wanted mm -hmm. with it. So I did that for a while, and then when I went with the feds, I didn't continue the program because they weren't going to pay for it, and I didn't feel like paying for the whole thing. And it wasn't going to help me in my career anyways. Mm -hmm. So I, I stopped doing it then, and that's, that's the extent of what I used it, the GI Bill for. And I haven't used anything with, I haven't gone to the VA for medical because as a government worker I had a good medical plan and all that. Mm -hmm. and I, I really didn't need to do, do that kind of stuff. Um, so I haven't used all of that. But uh, and I, Did you retire from that agency? And I retired from the state. I went back to the state after the, with the feds for a while because I was in during Reagan and he basically, all advancements in, in uh, federal service you know, was shut down basically, mm -hmm. so there was no future in that. And I went with the feds because that was um, traditionally a way to advance fairly quickly within that program. So I went back to the state, and at that point, the state of New York had opened an office in Albany, which they hadn't had before. And my wife's family was from Albany area, they're Loudonville, and I had family up here. Um, so we decided to move back to Albany with that. So and then I and I ended up with a with a state pension, a federal pension I just cashed in. It wasn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. Now, 
did you join uh, the American Legion? No, I, I um, had thought about it mm -hmm. at one point. Um, not early on. Uh, when I first got out, I really wanted to separate myself from the, sure. the military uh, altogether and just kind of put that behind me and go on my way. Um, and then a funny thing happened when I moved up here. There was an article in a, a local paper that they wanted to, folks wanted to create this monument to soldiers who were um, killed in Vietnam in, from Albany County, and the monument that now exists in Albany. Mm -hmm. And the way the article was written, it said uh, it would be a monument to the victims of the war. But it was for the soldiers, or for the military, military, but it said for the victims of the war. So I said, well, there's lots of victims of the war. I mean, what about the Vietnamese people? What about our own citizens? Uh, what about those kids at Kent State? Um, what about the, the people who, who uh, became so distraught they, they did a lot of drugs or they committed suicide or, or they moved to Canada or Sweden, mm -hmm. you know? Their whole life has changed. They're victims too. So I wrote a letter to the editor stating that. And I get a phone call from this guy, and his name was Bill Crapser. And uh, he said, oh, I saw your letter in the paper. He says, listen, do you know about this, this organization, the Veterans for Peace? And I said, no, I haven't heard of that. So he told me about it. Uh -huh. So that's how I found out about Veterans for Peace. And uh, eventually got to know Bill, a very fine writer, wrote a wonderful book about his experience as a Marine in Vietnam called Remains. Excellent book, one of the best that I've read on, on that. Uh, and he's a painter, and I believe he's still around. I don't know whether he's in this area or not, but I believe he's still with us. So that's where I found out about Veterans for Peace. So that's the veterans organization that I got involved with. Mm -hmm. So that was about 1972 or no, something? No, no, this is way after. This is 19... It's probably... It had to have been at least 87, 88, okay. because that's when I, when I happened when I moved up to Albany. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So uh, that's how I found out about Veterans for Peace and got involved with that. And after that, then I, I, I did join the Tri-County Council of Vietnam Era Veterans because they're the ones that sponsored the parades in Albany. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I think it was during the Kosovo War, um, we decided, our local Veterans for Peace, that we wanted to march in the parades. And so I called up. Um, the fellow organizing it, who was actually an assistant district attorney in Albany at the time. And I told him what we wanted to do. And it was for November, so it was Veterans Day. And I said, we want to march in the Veterans Day parade. And it was this sort of moment of silence on the other end, <laughs> shock, silence or whatever, uh, which I anticipated. I anticipated. And he said, well, well, I guess, yeah, I guess it would be all right. He says, but I don't want any signs about Kosovo or anything. I said, he said, oh, he said, what's your, what's your message? What's your mission? I said, our mission is to abolish war. He said, well, I guess we can all agree with that. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, he was a little wary uh -huh. of us and everything, but he let us march. Now, the funny thing is, the ace in the hole that I had was that if he had said no, my next phone call would have been to the Times Union, and I knew some reporters at the Times Union, and saying, well, you know, this veterans organization, Veterans for Peace, has told they can't march in the Veterans Day parade. <laughs> and I know across the country there are instances where that's happened, but um, since this was under the auspices of the city of Albany, I figured that was my ace in the hole. They, mm -hmm. they were getting an awful lot of bad publicity over there. Sure. But I didn't need it. I didn't need it. Um, the group uh, let us march, they didn't let us march on Memorial Day. So for a few years, I would call up each year. I think it was 1999 we first marched as a group, uh, formally. There mm -hmm. were years in the past where uh, four or five of us would just join in the parade at the very end. But uh, in 1999 we started. So for the first few years, I would contact them ahead of the parade and say we're interested in marching this year. But after that, to this day, we get the parade orders in the mail. The, the guy calls me up ahead of time saying, are you folks marching this year? Yep, okay, you're in. And we march every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I invite all peace groups and anybody, you don't have to be a, a member of Veterans for Peace, you don't even have to be a veteran to march with us. 
So we have this sort of Coxie's army kind of ragtag bunch of old, <laughs> old peasnicks, some, some in wheelchairs. We actually, we got a wheelchair one year because Ed Block was, had gotten to the point where he uh -huh. couldn't actually march. So we bought one of these transfer chairs. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, he was a little reluctant to do it, but he'd rather be in a parade. So he did, so that's our Ed Block uh, memorial transfer chair that we have <laughs> for him. So, uh, and we, we get a good reception from the, from the folks in there and, and from the, the other folks, the other veterans organization. It's not 100%, but I, many of them uh, are glad we're in the parade. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, you know, um, I, I, will, I will say that, that my, um, Membership in Veterans for Peace as a non-combat veteran uh, has really enriched my life in meeting lots of other combat veterans with similar views. And uh, you know, I was just down in Woodstock last night at a reading, a memorial reading for Jay Wank, who was very active, World War II vet, mm -hmm. and he just passed uh, this this May, and um, very active in Veterans for Peace, and a couple other fellows down there who are uh, Vietnam. Uh, vets uh, and very glad to have their friendship and their and their, some of them are poets like I'm a poet and uh, yeah, so we share an awful lot in, mm -hmm. in that regard. Yeah. Okay, sounds uh, sounds like you've had uh, quite the career. <laughs> yes, I have, and I um, uh, I'm I'm very active with going to peace vigils and stuff, mm -hmm. and I and my. People ask me about this. I said, you know, I was a reluctant soldier, uh, and I said it. But the the government made me a veteran, mm -hmm. so I'm going to use my veteran status to to maybe bring an end to wars. And uh, because when I go to parades or I go to events, uh, I'm wearing a Veterans for Peace shirt. I've got a hat on. I'm carrying a Veterans for Peace flag or a peace mm -hmm. flag. And uh, my friends say it's a media magnet. Media likes to talk to two veterans who are against wars, and, mm -hmm. stuff. and uh, I think it's a good way to bring the message out. And I've had people stop and talk to us about it. We have recently, in, uh, we were in Chatham. Uh, they do a peace vigil down there on Saturdays, and I was mm -hmm. down there with my friends. And uh, a guy came by in, in his truck. Not that being in a truck means anything that uh -huh. way. But he, he, he gave us this funny look uh -huh. anyways. He gave us a kind of funny look. And then the truck went up the street and then came back around and he parked on the other side of the street and he got out. And he was, I don't know, in his 40s or 50s. Uh, had like a camouflage type shirt on, but he had a cap on uh, that identified him as an uh, army veteran. Mm -hmm. So he came over and he had this kind of a scowl on his face. He wasn't, uh -huh. he wasn't smiling and, and he came over and uh, he said, so what's this about? So I spoke up and I said, you know, I got my veterans for peace hat, so he knows I'm a veteran. And I said, well, we, we have a do, do a peace vigil down here in Chatham every Saturday and um, we, just, we stand here for peace for an hour. And he says, so he didn't know what, really what to say. And then he said, so, so you, you, you against the troops? I said, no, we're not against the troops. I said, we're, we're against war, mm -hmm. we're gonna stop the war. We, we, are, we, don't, we don't have anything against the troops, it's, they're just doing what they have to do. He said, oh, he wasn't sure what to say. Well, I had a copy of uh, Veterans for Peace newspaper, Peace in Our Times there, so I gave mm -hmm. him a copy. I said, well, here, you can read this and, and uh, see what you think and whatever. And he went away and there was no, no problem with mm -hmm. it, but you could see, he was ready for a confrontation, yeah. you know, but being a veteran and speaking up to him, you know, and I, I always say that when I meet a veteran, I say, when do you serve? When did you serve? What branch were you in? So we start, he starts serving this, uh, setting up this connection. Sure. And I did the same thing with him and I asked him about, it, you know, and, and it also diverts any confrontational comment they might be thinking of making right off the bat to talking about themselves. So uh, uh, I find that, it, uh, like I said, uh, the government made me a veteran reluctantly, <laughs> so I'm going to use it. Now, did you ever uh, run into any people with uh, animosity or 
confrontations? There, there have been some. In fact, in the parade at, uh, in Albany at one time, there were, they have this motorcycle group that, that's in there now, the Patriot Guards, I think. Sure. So they're at, the, they're at the end of the parade. And not all of them are veterans. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say anything negative about them. Mm -hmm. But there was one guy in there when they, f I think the very first year they were in the parade, that came up to us and it was really, he got in a couple people's faces. Uh, and uh, he used to go through Del Mar too. I do the Peace Vigil in Del Mar on Mondays. He used to go through on his motorcycle and he would, he'd see me and he'd scream out, traitor. Really? Yeah. Um, but he was, the, 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 he was the aberration, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, I mean, uh, I understand that there may be veterans out there that in the parade that that don't like our, our presence or don't understand it, but they're keeping it to themselves mm -hmm. and they're not saying anything. On the other hand, there are members of the that I know in the Tri County Council of Vietnam era veterans who are on our side, but they just they just don't talk about it and think they're concerned with other veterans issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. But but they are glad that we are there speaking up. And uh, it's just something that they wouldn't do. But uh, you, you occasionally you, you, you get that. With this guy, I don't know whether he was a veteran. I never got to the point where I could say to him, well, when did you serve? Kind of thing, you know, uh -huh. and put him on the spot. And I didn't really want to. I just wanted to avoid it. And, but it's very, very rare that you get that. And again, like I say, if once you know, somebody identifies himself, it happens with street people. Mm -hmm. You know, some homeless guy on the street, oh, I'm a veteran. So I, I asked them, no. what's your name? When did you serve? What branch did you serve? Sometimes I'll ask them what their MOS was. Sometimes I'll ask them what their MOS was to weed out the guys who are not really veterans. Some I guys understand. Are veterans, yes. you know. So, so what was your MOS? And they draw a blank. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. All right. Um, anything else you'd, you'd like to add? Uh, did you have any paperwork you wanted to show us? Uh, no, I wrote my, I also forgot my DD-214 only as a reference, so I remember what uh, the dates were and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, you know, and of course there's the Honorable District. I did get, oh, here's a, eh, when was this? This was in the, must have been in the 90s. Uh, was under, was it the first Bush? First President Bush, maybe it was second president. I don't know. But at some point, at some point, they, uh, a friend of mine saw this thing in the paper, and it said if you wrote to some, some government agency uh, and tell them what years you were in the service, mm -hmm. they would, um, and you didn't have to be military, uh, uh, combat or anything like that, just in the military during a, a very broad period of time that included Included Vietnam, but include all the years after. I think up till the fall of the of the wall in Berlin. I think that was it. Because the thank you certificate I got, signed by Donald Rumsfeld, if I remember correctly, said um, for being a Cold War veteran. It was a certificate of appreciation for being a Cold War veteran. Yes, I, I've heard of those. <laughs> those yes. So I did get one of those. I, figured I, just, uh -huh. I got them put in my office. I just more as a joke than anything else. <laughs> so that's it. yeah, I can't. I can't really think of anything else. Um, uh, I'm. I, I will say this. I want to commend you folks here at the New York State uh, Military History Museum for for doing this project and for the work that you do to to preserve these stories. Um, you know that often get lost. So thank you for the things you're doing here. Well, thank you. And thank you for coming in and doing the interview. Okay. And, uh, and thank you for your service. Oh, my real service is working for peace. Amen. <laughs>